Number 10, Will Carroll. Will Carroll, the drummer of the band Death Angel, caught COVID-19 at the end of his band's European tour. It was a long, hard battle, and thankfully, Carroll was able to come back from it. But the battle along the way may have included an encounter with Satan himself. The virus put him in a critical state, which involved Carroll lying unconscious in his hospital bed for 12 days straight. In an interview with San Francisco Chronicle, though, Will revealed that those 12 days were spent in a peaceful dream state. In his dreams, or I would would call them nightmares, the devil would punish him repeatedly for the sin of sloth. The devil would apparently turn him into a bulbous like creature and make him puke blood until his heart gave out. These were the dreams he was having over and over again. Since recovering from the disease, needless to say, Carol has changed his lifestyle habits. For more reason than this one, it appears recovering from this awful virus we all hate definitely felt like returning from hell. Maybe the virus is from there too. Wouldn't be surprised. To be honest. In our number nine spot, we have the Stargazer. A young man by the name of Harry lived in the country on a farm and was fascinated by the stars. He was given a telescope for Christmas one year and he would look up at the stars and study them every night. One night, he spotted something in the sky like nothing he had ever seen before. It was a triangle metal looking object flying in the sky. He thought that it had to be a UFO. He ran inside to call his friend and tell tell him about it, and after he got off the telephone, he heard a knock on his door. He opened it to see three men dressed in black from head to toe. There was something a bit weird about them though. They all kind of looked alike, and their noses were almost non-existent. Before Harry could speak, they were telling him to forget what he had seen and never speak of it again. They also subtly threatened his family and his future if he spoke about it. Terrified, he vowed not to. He eventually decided to share his story on online because technically he wouldn't be speaking about it. Upon years of reflection, Harry believes that he met some kind of alien. Number 8, Rose La Tulipe. It appears that the devil and the violin kind of go hand in hand. The story of Rose La Tulipe is a famous French Canadian story and one of my absolute favorites. The woman who shared this story with me swears it was true and I can't help but believe it either. Rose begged her father to host a dance on the eve of Lent and he agreed but with one condition, that at midnight the dancing had to stop. Dancing wasn't allowed during Lent, so if they continued, they would be sinning. Rose agreed, and everyone came to join on the night, and Rose danced with anyone who would, even with other men, though she was engaged. Then at 11 p.m., a knock came at the door, and the priest opened it to reveal a dazzlingly handsome stranger, and Rose fell hard. The priest welcomed him and requested that he take off his hat, shoes, and jacket, all of which the man refused, saying he wasn't staying long. He immediately immediately swept Rose in a dance and asked no one else for the remainder of the evening. As soon as midnight hit, the dancing stopped, but the man whispered in her ear, just one last dance, my Rose. With struggle she resisted, but suddenly her feet, bewitched it seemed, began dancing without her. The man then kissed her and the spark from their kiss set the house ablaze. The next morning Rose was found mumbling around the ashes, now mysteriously an old woman, the devil having taken part of her soul with him. I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. That sounds like a legend, but like thanks for indulging me because I really love that story and I want an opportunity to tell it. So here it is. Other versions say that he, she actually got taken back to hell with him and another is that her mother came and saved her. A whole bunch of stuff, but I think that one's my favorite. Okay, number seven, Richard Cable. Richard Cable might as well have been the devil himself. A squire at Brook Manor in Devon, England in the 1600s, he was known as a monstrously cruel man. He his wife, and one night she escaped him with him hot on her heels. He killed her and her faithful dog, but little did the man know that that dog would haunt him for the rest of his days, and there would be many, at least that's what Cable thought. Cable had made a deal with the devil to live forever, but mysteriously, Cable passed away in 1677. But it appears the devil did give him everlasting life, as a spirit walking the moors at night, forever being chased by a herd of hounds. The locals even put iron bars around his tomb because there were so so many sightings of him wandering around the moors. Instead, now, a red glow occasionally emits from his resting place and the howls of demons are said to gather, waiting to claim his soul for their master. Number 6, Saint Dunstan. Saint Dunstan was a saint who lived in 900s and for some reason the devil loved 
to visit him. He was a talented metalsmith and one day an old man requested that he make a chalice for him. Dunstan agreed but when he looked back up the old man he had shifted into a woman and then very suddenly a boy. Immediately he knew it was the devil but fearing his wrath concealed his distress and crafted the chalice. Subtly though he put his blacksmith tongs in the fire and quick as he could he thrust the tongs onto Satan's nose and cast him from the cell. That wouldn't be the last time he saw the devil though. Dunstan would face him once again and attack the devil by hammering into his hoof and only agreed to remove it if the devil agreed never to cross a threshold where a horseshoe hung. And that's why today horseshoes are considered good luck, so take a lesson from that. Number 5, A Boy Named Scott An article written by Richard J. Bonifant recounts several near-death experiences in order to try and see similarities. Some usually describe a light or a tunnel, but after a little boy named Scott got into an accident, he may have met something much darker. On June 10th, 1995, Scott and his family were enjoying getting ice cream from the ice cream truck, as you do, but Scott was so excited he ran out from behind the truck and he got hit by another motorist. He was almost declared dead, but 8 hours later, thankfully, he awoke in intense of care. The weirdest part was that he described in perfect detail what had happened to him as if he was watching from across the street. He knew every single detail. It was really freaky. He even recalled trying to give his dad a hug, but passing right through him. The scariest thing though was who he ended up meeting. He suddenly faced a dark vortex and felt himself being drawn into it by the haunting, putrid image of the devil. Scott said he looked like a man made of rotting flesh and he tried to grab Scott, but he was whisked away into a tunnel of light, so it was kind of like the devil's trying to steal him from God. I'm glad things ended well for the little boy, getting to be with his family again, but still, not something anyone wants to see in the afterlife. Number 4, Dr. Paul Thigpen. All of a sudden I felt as if the darkness had filled my whole body and that there was maybe a little part of it. It was still me. That was a clip of an interview with Dr. Paul Thigpen, who despite being raised under a Christian household, became an atheist before he was even 12 years old. That is until one day he was hanging with his friends when he was around 17 by the water in the front seat of a car, all three of them were squished in, and a palpable darkness began pressing into the top of his head all the way to the bottom of his toes. He said it took over the majority of his body and though he'd become an atheist, he didn't drink or do drugs so we know this isn't a psychedelic experience, but his body suddenly felt like a kind of superhuman strength taking over him. A voice in his head whispered, I'm throwing you into the water. To this day, Dr. Paul can't swim and his body started moving across his friend's seat to leave the car. He knew he was going to die. Then he heard another voice that said focus on the cross. He suddenly remembered the cross his girlfriend gave him, so he grabbed it and meanwhile his friends were like freaking out. After holding the cross for a while, he said the darkness subsided and when he told his friend what had happened, he said, that's strange, the same thing happened to my girlfriend. He sought counsel from another friend who without a doubt said that he had been visited by the devil. Later he discovered that his girlfriend's friend was a witch and that kind of pointed all the arrows in that direction, so who knows. Was it a demon or in fact the devil, either way something changed his mind. Watch the rest of the interview and decide for yourself. Number three, the man with the glowing eyes. Reddit user Dabby underscore you underscore 69 had an experience as a kid that I don't think anyone could be the same after. They grew up in a pagan household, which apparently meant you, you saw a lot of weird stuff. But one day, on a Tuesday in the afternoon, she was playing with the daughter of a family friend who they called Jay. Just outside as you do. So they're just playing and then all of a sudden Jay just stops dead in her tracks and points behind her. She froze and then turned around slowly to see, and I quote, a tall shadow man man about 6-7 feet tall in a trench coat and hat. The scariest thing about him was his eyes, oh god his eyes, huge red and glowing circles but its actual eyes were small, bloodshot and his pupils were tiny. The man reportedly tried to strangle them but they bolted too quick for the house. Once they told their moms they in turn freaked out because apparently at the same time the man appeared, the TV had turned long static. They brought in a psychic who said, my love the devil is here and he wants to hurt you, he was sent by someone but we don't know who. The woman then gave a crystal bottle filled with sage and lavender along with something else to ward him off and apparently the bottle is running out. So I hope she's okay. Number 2. Father Gabriel Amorth 
Father Gabriel Morth was the official exorcist for the Diocese of Rome and claimed to have performed 60,000 exorcisms before he died in 2016. But one day in 1997 he encountered a spirit he never thought he'd see. A slim young peasant man was escorted to a small room where Father Amorth waited him. Immediately he knew something was wrong. He requested the help of Jesus and as soon as he did the man began to spit and curse in English which wasn't a language the man was known to speak. But then the man was seething with anger and drool to from his mouth as he stared down the father. He tried to attack him, but the exorcist held him back with prayers, demanding the demon reveal its name. He called out, Unclean spirit, whoever you are, and all your companions who possess this servant of God, I command you, tell me your name, the day and the hour of your damnation. The man snarled, and what came out next paralyzed him. Dripping evil, the man said, I am Lucifer. He continued fighting the devil with prayer, and the windows formed ice crystals as he did so. The man also bent backwards for 25 minutes, howling at him, then began hovering at three feet in the air. Was it him? We don't know. We just don't know, but it certainly sounds like it. Number one, last but not least, we kind of have to talk about this because I think a bunch of people saw the devil here. Castle Huska is one of the creepiest places in the world as it was specifically built to keep the devil inside. Legend says that the castle was built over a gateway to hell. From afar, it looks like a typical old castle until you get closer. The castle wasn't built to be lived in as evident by the fake windows and doors. Though there is a way inside, people don't recommend you step foot in there. In 878 AD, winged beasts and half-human creatures spilled from the gateway and terrorized the people in the village. Somehow they held them off long enough to build the place, but they were still curious. When construction first began, prisoners in the village would be offered a pardon if they agreed to be lowered by rope into the hole. The first man to attempt it is said to have met the devil himself while he was down there. He was tied up and slowly lowered. After a few moments in the darkness, the man began screaming and begged to be pulled up. By the time they hauled him up, he looked as though he aged 30 years. His hair was white, his skin creased and speckled. They tried to discover what he had seen, but the man was incoherent and was later put into an insane asylum before dying two days later. Starting us off at number 10, we have Kazam, otherwise known as Shaquille O'Neal. For any of you have seen that movie, man oh man, I rewatched it recently and I do not think it holds up. But if there are Kazam fans watching, please let me know what you think down in the comments. Anyway, back to Shaq. Shaquille O'Neal was born March 6, 1972 and little did his mother know, she would be giving birth to one of the most famous basketball players of all time as well as a modern giant. Shaq clocks in at 7 feet 1 inch, which is 2.16 meters in height and has quite the list of hilarious pictures comparing his size to other popular celebrities. One of my favorites is a picture of him with a-list comedian Kevin Hart. We all know Kevin is a shorter guy, but next to Shaq, he looks like a tiny villager. Luckily for Kevin, Shaq is just one large friendly giant unless he's on the court. Shaq no longer plays basketball, but is now a sports analyst on NBA related TV shows, and even though nowadays he- Number 9, Giuseppe Tartini. Everybody wants to be the best at something, but for Tartini, the best just wasn't good enough. Tartini was born on April 8th, 1692, and the guy might as well have been born with a violin in his hand. And he was brilliant, a brilliant musician and composer, and he thought so too, until one day he heard someone playing the instrument he dedicated his life to with a kind of expertise that he had never heard. This sent him spiraling, and for 12 days, Tartini locked himself away, practicing all hours of the day. While he drove himself mad, the devil decided to pay a visit to a desperate soul in a dream. He offered to make Tartini the most masterful violinist in the world in exchange for his soul. Like the wise guy he was, he asked for a demonstration. So the devil picked up the instrument and played a sonata with ease and beauty like nothing he'd ever heard before. When Giuseppe awoke, he scrambled to write down the sonata, which has become easily one of his most popular pieces of work. Its name, The Devil's Trill, and I listened to it and it is beautiful. For his entire career though, Tartini remained frustrated with the piece as he was never able to play it exactly as he had heard it. This story is a reminder to never make a deal with the devil as you never really get what you asked for. At number eight, we're going back to the NBA with a basketball superstar, Yao Ming. This famous NBA superstar was born September 12th, 1980 in Shanghai, China. Yao Ming's height is an incredible seven feet six inches or 200 
329 centimeters. This giant featherless being has a wingspan of 226 centimeters, which is basically just as tall as he is, and his feet are size 18. Those aren't shoes, those are freaking water skis. Before coming to play for the NBA, he played for the Shanghai Sharks in the Chinese Basketball Association, and was then drafted to the NBA in 2002 to the Houston Rockets, where he there played until 2011. In February of 2017, Ming was elected as the chairman of the Chinese Basketball Association. Now, there is also a documentary titled The Year of Yao, filmed during his rookie year with the Rockets, as well as a book he co-wrote with NBA analyst Rick Butcher, titled Yao, A Life in Two Worlds. So if you want to get to know him a little bit more, check those out. If you want to see how this giant dominated the court, I'm sure you can find tons of old Rocket games all over the internet. At number 7, staying in China, but going back to the 1840s, we have Chang Yu Sing. Sing grew up to be 7 feet 9 inches tall, which is 236 centimeters, and was appointed as a member of the Emperor's Court. Later on in his life, he left China for England on what was only supposed to be a brief visit, but that brief visit ended up turning out to be a two-year stay. During his stay in England, many people would stop him and pay three shillings just to see him. Later on, taking advantage of the extra cash, he went on tour through the rest of Europe and was shown off alongside another little person just like Anna Haining Bates. He later also joined P.T. Barnum's circus and was also known to have many female admirers. By the sounds of it though, none of them lasted because I could not find any info on whether he was actually ever married. Maybe he just liked the bachelor life too much. <laughs> I get it. Anyway, Chang Yu Sing later passed away in 1893 and his funeral was only attended by 50 of his closest friends due to his own wishes. His coffin was 8 feet 5 inches long, that's 260 centimeters, and I don't want to imagine what it was like being one of those pallbearers. If I was one of them, I probably would have let him down. At number 6, we have Patrick Cotter O'Brien. Patrick was born in Kinsale, Ireland on January 19, 1760. He grew up to be 8 feet 1 inch tall, which is 244 centimeters, and he was the first of 13 known people to grow past 244 centimeters. At the age of 18, he worked as a bricklayer. Needless to say, unlike the rest of his bricklaying colleagues, he did not need a ladder to reach the top of the cottages that they were working on. After he had enough of bricklaying, just like the most of the other giants on my list, he went into show business where he later went just by the name of O'Brien. He traveled around in a specially made carriage, and apparently he was once stopped by a highwayman who went seeing the giant O'Brien inside immediately ran away with his tail between his legs. His massive weight took quite the toll on his body, which brought him to his death on September 8, 1806, at the age of 46. I'm sure his weight caused him many troubles and struggles, but I bet it wasn't easy for the horses pulling him in the carriage either. That being said, the more horses, the easier it is to pull a eight foot tall giant. That's the old saying, right? Coming in at our halfway point at number five, we have another Canadian, Joseph Edward Beaupre. Joseph was born in Willowbunch, Saskatchewan on January 9, 1881. His parents were what was considered average height, and honestly, so was he until the age of three, and he started growing like crazy. By the age of nine, he outgrew his own parents, and he was six and a half feet tall. At the age of 17, he was so big that it is reported that he lifted an 800 pound horse. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, then that means he was not only tall, this guy was yoked too. He reached his full giant potential at the age of 23 at eight feet three inches. That's 251 centimeters. He had to wear a giant custom made shoes that were size 22. If Yao Ming shoes are water skis, then these are freaking snowboards for each foot. He had dreams of becoming a cowboy, but gave up because his feet would still touch the ground while atop his bucking bronco. He later joined a circus as well as hoping to capitalize on his size, but it took its toll on him, especially because he suffered from tuberculosis. He sadly died on July 3rd at the age of 23. Now, this story gets pretty sad. After his death, the circus refused to help his father pay for the burial, so his body stayed with the undertakers, who then started displaying his corpse in store windows and museums. In 1907, his corpse was found in an old circus hangar and was then given to Montreal University where it is mummified and stored. In 1970, Ovilla Lesperance, descendant of Joseph, requested her relative's body back, but was at first denied because the university didn't want his body stolen and put up for display again. Finally, Ovilla got her relative's body back and Joseph was cremated in September of 1989, 85 years after his death. Even though his circus employers and maybe the Montreal University people are now deceased, I still have one thing to say to you. Screw you guys. At number 4, we have Arthur K. Cayley. Arthur Cayley was born in Sulby, Isle of Man in 1824 and was considered a normal sized human being until his late teens when he started growing much, much taller. Maybe it was an after effect of puberty. He reached 7 feet 11 inches tall, which equals to 241 centimeters. He weighed over 392 pounds, which is 178 kilograms. His size earned him the name Manx Giant, and he was known to be a bit more wide than his other giant friends as well. He was frequently seen in exhibits in Manchester, London, and Paris before suddenly and mysteriously disappearing. Appearing. His mother reported that he was dead, but many doubted this because his life had been insured for 2,000 pounds only a few weeks prior. They believe it was a case of insurance fraud and that a tree was 
actually buried in his place. Sure enough, Cayley was not actually dead. He traveled also to join P.T. Barnum's circus, and he was known as Colonel Ruth Goshen, the Arabian Giant. His former life as the Manx Giant stayed a well kept secret until his death in 1889. At number three, we have Angus McCaskill. Angus was born on the island of Bernay in Scotland back in 1825. The Guinness World Record books recognize him as the tallest true giant to have ever lived because his height was not caused by any kind of growth abnormality. Funnily enough, he was so small at birth that doctors didn't believe that he would survive. Now, Angus only grew to 7 feet 9 inches or 236 centimeters, which may not seem like much after a few of our friends on the list here, but trust me when I say this guy was still absolutely massive. He had the biggest chest ever, coming in at 203 centimeters or 80 inches around. He weighed in at 500 pounds. That's 227 kilograms in case you wanted to know. Oh, and by the way, he could lift a 2,800 pound ship's anchor. He was also known to carry a 100 pound weight, which is 45 kilograms, for 10 minutes using only two fingers. Angus often received requests from people wanting to wrestle him. If those challengers didn't have the same size as Angus, they most certainly had guts. He then, of course, later joined the circus and toured through Cuba and the East Indies until going to Europe and North America. After retiring from the circus, he went into real estate and opened up his own store. Sadly, in 1880, 1963, he died from brain fever. Can you imagine rolling up to a house and seeing this guy out front? The outside is perfect and beautiful, but I don't know a damn clue what it looks like on the inside. Can you let me know? At number two, we have Bernard Coyne, aka Bernard the Giant. Original name, huh? Bernard was born in Anthon, Iowa on July 27th, 1897. His actual height is cause for dispute because some report him being eight foot two inches, while others say he was eight foot four inches, while even more people saying that he was eight feet eight inches. No matter what though, he was over eight feet, which is over 240 centimeters tall. He was so tall that he was actually rejected by the army, probably because they could see him coming from miles away and that they were too scared that his rations would need to be three times the size of anyone else's. Unlike most other giant people whose height is a result of abnormalities in the pituitary gland, Bernard's height was from the unicoidal infantile gigantism, a very rare syndrome. His parents would put him on display for extra money when he was younger, but later decided against it because they didn't want to be on the receiving end of the wrath of God. <laughs> Good idea, jerks. Bernard preferred a quiet life and turned down countless offers to go on exhibit ever again. His shoes were a size 24, which means they're considered something, I don't know, bigger than a snowboard, and he weighed in at 300 pounds, which is 136 kilograms. He sadly passed away at the age of 23. Man, being put on display for a couple of extra bucks by your parents. <laughs> Too bad child services were not around yet. And finally, coming in at our number one spot, if you ever visited Clifton Hill on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls, you'll know this guy. Robert Wadlow. Robert was born on February 22nd, 1918, at a normal size. However, he quickly started growing at the age of five and he was already wearing clothes intended for teenagers. At age eight, he was taller than his five foot 11 inch father and could even carry him up the stairs. He then joined the Boy Scouts at age 13 and had to have his own uniform, tent, and sleeping bag specially made for him. In 1936, he joined the Ringling Brothers Circus as a curiosity. He had a huge appetite and ate around 8,000 calories a day. In case you're wondering, the average human eats 2,000 to 2,400 calories a day. Damn, that guy can eat. He unfortunately suffered from some leg issues and had to wear leg braces and also often use a cane. But nevertheless, he kept growing. Sadly, one day, one leg brace was fitted improperly and ended up causing him a huge blister on his ankle, which then became infected. Tragically, the infection killed him at the age of 22 on July 15th, 1940. He was last measured June 27th, 1940 at 8 feet 11 inches, which is 272 centimeters. He was a true giant and not only was he actually missed, but so is his Niagara Falls statue you at the Guinness Book of Records Museum. I remember countless trips where I actually measured myself up against him and that was a lot of fun. Miss you, Robbie. In our number 10 spot, we have UFO spotting in Washington. Two harbor patrolmen in the Washington state named Harold H. Dahl and Fred L. Chrisman spotted a UFO over the water of Puget Sound, Washington. It was 1947 and after this incident, they were approached by a man dressed in black that forcefully advised them to to not discuss the incident further. This was one of the first sightings of the men in black. The men were described as being extremely mysterious, never looking the patrolman in the eyes. Ooh, probably to cover up their reptile eyes, am I right? 
At number 9, we have Anna Haining Bates. Born in the Canadian province of Nova Scotia back in August of 1846, Anna was just like every other child until she started a bit of a growth spurt. A growth spurt that never ended. By age 5, she was already 4 feet 8 inches. That's 142 centimeters. And weighed over 100 pounds. That's over 45 kilograms. Finally, at age 22, she came in at 7 feet 6 inches. That's 229 centimeters and weighed 350 pounds, which is 159 kilograms. Bates went into show business around the age of 16 and would often be shown opposite to a little person to show the incredible difference in size. But being that tall has its disadvantages. In July of 1865, Anna almost burned to death during a fire at the famous P.T. Barnum Museum. The stairs were engulfed in flames and she was too tall to jump out the window. Luckily for her, she was saved by other museum employees who broke through walls to escort her out and was then assisted with a crane. That's crazy. It's hard enough sometimes getting emergency crews to the scene, let alone a crane. But hey, I'm guessing they didn't have the same kind of Toronto traffic as we do nowadays. Anna then later went on to marry another giant by the name of Martin Van Buren, aka the Kentucky Giant, who was 7 feet 3 inches tall. She later got pregnant with two children, but they both tragically died at birth. Anna herself later died in 1888 at the age of 41. In our number 8 spot, we have the President's Men in Black. In 2012, it was discovered that President Obama of the USA had a few men in black working for him that could have very well been from another world. Footage was discovered of his security at the US-Israel Policy Conference and they were looking rather alien-like. From the front, completely normal. From the back, we see a bald man with no ears and a pointy chin. His nose looks short and rounded and his eyes appear to be dark and sunken in. Do you think there were possibly alien men in black guards guarding the president that day? It's definitely possible. In our number 7 spot we have the fire watch sighting. A man named Gabe was working a shift at a fire watch tower in the woods when he saw a black SUV pull up in the wee hours of the morning. A few minutes later the sound of a firearm went off. The next thing he knew there was a knock on his tower and two large men in black were waiting behind the door. He opened the door and they immediately questioned him, asking him to reveal what he saw. He said he saw nothing, and after a moment they appeared to believe him. They told him to never speak of this experience to anyone. Looking back, he definitely thinks he met one of the men in black. Originally, he chalked these men up to some kind of gang, but now he definitely thinks that those two men were the men in black. In our number 6 spot, we have the UFO researcher. In 1976, Dr. Herbert Hopkins, who is a UFO researcher, got a call from someone who claimed to be a rep from a New Jersey UFO organization. The man asked if Hopkins was alone and if Hopkins would be willing to share his research. Hopkins said sure and began sharing with him. Once he hung up the phone, a man was at his doorstep. He described the man as being bald without eyebrows, wearing a neatly tailored black suit. He had red lips and pale white skin. The man took out a coin and told Hopkins to watch it. It started to develop a silver color instead of copper, and then the silver became bluish and the penny was getting quite fuzzy, you know, out of focus, blurred, and then it was simply gone. Apparently after this incident, he was instructed to destroy all of his research. In our number 5 spot, we have the Dan Ackard story. This story is wild to me because I have literally had the thought, why doesn't the dad from Crossroads barely work anymore? <laughs> Did Hollywood cast him out? Like I've literally just thought about this last week. Well that honestly might be the case and I certainly wonder about that after hearing about how he shared this story with people online. So 20 years ago in 2002, 20 years ago, wow, Dan was creating a series called Out There for the Sci-Fi Channel and it talked about UFOs, alien abductions, crop circles and all kinds of extraterrestrial research. One day he was in the middle of doing some interviews when he went outside between 42nd and 8th Street in New York for a break and he went on a phone call with Britney Spears, funny enough, talking to him about their new movie when he looked out at the street and saw a long black SUV and two guys in black outside of it. One was very tall and they were just glaring at him. He turned away for a second and when he looked back, they were gone. He has gone on record to say that he knows what he saw and there was absolutely no way that they could have turned on that street because he would have seen them. They disappeared as if they had some kind of cloaking device. He found out that his show was cancelled later that day. In our number 4 spot we have the Niagara Hotel. 
a manager of a hotel in Niagara by the name of Sovar and his security guard reported seeing a triangular UFO outside their building. A group called the Aerial Phenomena Investigations Team reported the incident with the two men's consent. A few weeks later, two tall men in black suits came into the hotel and spoke with Sovar and the security guard. They freaked out the employees allegedly as they had identical faces, no eyebrows or eyelashes and were very pale. These two men were caught on surveillance for the hotel and that footage definitely makes me feel very nervous. <laughs> a small part of me wants to go to Niagara and ask every hotel about this incident and just you know find out which hotel it is. In our number three spot, we have the library. Apparently, a professor by the name of Peter Rojowitz claimed that he once was reading a UFO book in the library when all of a sudden, a strange pale man wearing all black sat down next to him. The man suddenly began talking to the professor and asked him questions about flying saucers and his opinion on them. Peter said, that he wasn't super interested in them. The man became very agitated by this. He eventually left and the professor felt super uncomfortable. Upon reflection, he is sure that he met a man in black official. In our number two spot, we have the disc. A man by the name of Paul Miller experienced something so crazy one day when he was coming home from a hunting trip. He looked up and saw a luminous disc in the sky. The disc landed in a field and two humanoids left the craft. Paul had a weapon on him and so he fired at the beings as he ran away and he believes that he managed to hurt one of them. As he was running away from the scene, in a blink of a moment, he realized that he had lost time. It was suddenly three hours later than when he first saw saw the aircraft. He shrugged it off and went back to work as normal the next day. But when he got to work, three men in black suits approached him. He was informed that they had his file. He hadn't even told anyone about what he experienced, but these men said they knew all about it. They told him that it was best he forget about what happened. Yikes. In our number one spot, we have the photograph. A man by the name of Jim Templeton took a nice photo of his daughter holding some flowers, and when he got it developed, he discovered something else in the photo that was not there when he took it. A sort of white spaceman. How could this be? He took it to Kodak and they authenticated it, and from there, his story went public. Not too long after, he was approached by two government agents that called themselves number nine and number 10. They demanded to see the site of where the photo was taken, and when they discovered that Templeton didn't actually see the spaceman in person, that he just showed up in the photograph, they got very angry and walked away. Not long after that, Templeton was contacted by two employees at a missile launch pad that was located near the site where the photo was taken, and these men claimed that they had seen two figures that resembled the men in the photo. Ooh, so weird. Props an alien spaceman. What a wild story. Mm -hmm.